Hello, friends. Welcome to the Nexus Podcast. I'm your host, James Dice. Each week, I fire questions at the leaders of the smart buildings industry to try to figure out where we're headed and how we can get there faster without all the marketing fluff. I'm pushing my learning to limit, and I'm so glad to have you here following along. Before we get started, here's a quick note from our sponsor. I'd like to introduce all of you to Sam Kovar and his company, Tiatoa. Tiatoa is an acronym for Take In Everything, Take On Anything. And after participating in the Nexus Foundations course, Sam got hooked on smart buildings and he wants to Tiatoa anything our industry can throw at him. As an outsider, he sees a future where this industry can move forward faster with better communications. He wants to be an independent, creative resource for helping you guys the Nexus community connect to their customers and grow your audiences. He's got 15 plus years of experience in strategic communications, creative consulting, technical execution for video, animation, and photography. So connect with Sam using the link in the show notes and learn more. This episode is a conversation with Matt Ellis, founder and CEO of Measurable, the ESG platform. We talked about Measurable's product, their recent acquisitions, their product roadmap, and why the platform approach is key to serving the ESG market. So if you nerd out like I do on decarbonization and technology and real estate, you gotta love listening to Matt. Before we dive in, a quick Nexus Labs announcement. We recently launched the Nexus Labs Syndicate, allowing the Nexus community, as long as you're an accredited investor, the chance to co-invest in startups together. So check it out at the link in the show notes. Without further ado, please enjoy the Nexus podcast with Matt Ellis. Hello, Matt. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you on. Can you start by introducing yourself? Sure. Hey, James. Thanks for having me. Um, my name is Matt Ellis. I'm founder and CEO of Measurable. Um, Measurable is the world's most widely adopted ESG technology for real estate. We serve about uh, 850 customers across 90 countries, representing about two and a half trillion in asset value and some almost 14 billion square feet, all product types, data centers, office buildings, industrial, corporate tenants, and we help them measure, manage, report, and ultimately act on ESG. All right, is that all Is that all the buildings you have? You don't have any more than that? So I still may I look around the corner and see if I can find one or two to share. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, so let's start with your background. I'd love to, I know that you were a, a broker at one point, uh, so background in the real estate industry, but maybe you could just take us through and tell us the story firsthand. Yeah, happy to do that. So it's true. Um, maybe a lot of reform brokers don't like to admit it, but I was in the leasing business uh, to starting in 2008. I worked for CBRE, uh, auspicious year for being in the real estate leasing business. Totally. The financial crisis. Uh, my job was specifically tenant rep. So what I would do is I'd go around and knock on doors to try to find tenants to represent in their lease transactions with landlords. And I did that in industrial properties. And so I was working in an industrial park one day in the summer, East County, San Diego, knocking on doors. And I will never forget stopping under the awning of a, of a building uh, to get some shade and cool off. And I noticed on the door there was this decal that said, Energy Star certified. And I kind of stared at it and thought, you know, what in the world is this doing there? And what does it mean to the landlord? What does it mean to the tenant? I went back to my office that day and I wanted to try to look busy for my boss. And so I sat in my cube and I remember thinking of things to kind of Google and I typed in Energy Star building. And that was the first time I got acquainted with the idea of green building. Okay. I'd, I'd had a personal interest in sustainability. I never thought that that could be part of my professional life. Uh, but this opened a, a window for it and skipping over several years, I ultimately became the director of sustainability solutions for CBRE. So that job was really a corporate entrepreneur job. I would create and commercialize services related to energy and sustainability. Now this is still early days. This is you know, 2011, 2012, 2013, the beginnings of the green transformation in real estate uh, mm -hmm. were, were, were glimmers out there. And I was able, and in a fortunate position, to see those early signs of this radical transformation towards sustainability and ESG. Um, so that really is where Measurable came from. It was my wanderings working on energy and sustainability matters. It was my observation that this was a revolution uh, of extraordinary magnitude. 
And it was my other observation that there was just one problem is we couldn't measure it. Really hard to go out and talk to customers about where they were, how green or not green, where they needed to get to if we had no real objective measures of sustainability. And that was what Measurable was designed to solve. It was about bringing technology to bear to measure sustainability performance objectively, transparently, timely fashion, and to bring that data and that visibility back to the customer in the market and allow the market to move and act more efficiently um, for better outcomes for all as a result. So that's really where, where Measurable came from was that, that real estate background, that experience, and then recognizing some of these important trends and transformations and, and some of the challenges around that came with that. Nice, nice. And so when did you start the company? Uh, what, what year was that? Yeah, 2013, the good old days. <laughs> the good old days, all right. Uh, and then fast forward today, you you mentioned all the you know different buildings you're in, markets you're in, all that. Um, you know, can you can you give us an update on how many people are in the company? Like, what what sure. is the company at today? Yeah, yeah, it's kind of a fun. It's fun to fast forward. Look, I mean, James, we've been around ten years. It, it's not a startup anymore. This is absolutely a scale up business. Um, mm-hmm. But those ten years, there's a lot that happened. There's a lot that didn't happen in those ten years. I thought when I left CB to pursue this business that that we were on the cusp of this transformation, that it was tomorrow. It wasn't exactly the case. (laughs) Those first few early years, you know, trying to find our way to the first few customers, the first million in ARR, the first 10 employees and so on. Um, That was, you know, that was hard work and, and good work, though. It really taught me a lot about technology and building a technology company and meeting customer need. Um, I'm happy to not be doing that anymore these days. It's quite a bit different. So the answer to your question is we're now about $100 million in venture capital raised. We have 275 or so people working for us across Europe and North America and some other far-flung outposts. And, uh, you know, the the business now has gone from trying to build a, a really formative technology product to help companies measure, manage, report on sustainability uh, to, to having a multi-product platform that helps them do all that, do all that better. And then ultimately, of course, act, drive outcomes in their business around sustainability and drive ROIs. And that's where we're at today. Nice. Nice. And yeah, I want to unpack, we're going to talk about platforms. Uh, it'll be kind of in line with uh, our mutual friend, uh, Pierre and, and I's conversations yes. around okay, cool. around platforms. Um, he's going to be on the podcast soon. So maybe he'll have like a response uh, to this as well. But let's start. You have this phrase that I love that I've heard you talk about a couple of times now, this uh, from meter to market. Can you kind of unpack what you mean by that? Give me the date for Pierre's session, will you? Because I, I can't wait to listen to that. You'll you zoom, you're going to Zoom bomb? You're going to Zoom bomb with Pierre's show? Yeah, yeah I'd love to. Whether he'd like it or not, I'm not sure. So <laughs> um, let's see. You're, you're, you know, the question around meter to market, what does that mean? Um, it means a lot to us and maybe even the industry. So at Measurable, meter to market is our catchphrase for describing the product vision of the business. Meter, think of it, put it on a... On a, a line meters at the extreme left and markets at the extreme right okay meter represents all the in-building considerations related to sustainability it's about real-time data capture from boilers and chillers and hvac systems to make sense of the building's operating health it's about indoor air quality and anything else that's going on mechanically or operationally in that asset moving from meter kind of towards market, the next major stopping point is outside that asset and into the portfolio of assets. So we're getting from the systems to the building itself and from the building to the many buildings that typically form a real estate portfolio. That gets us to um, all these other concerns, regulatory compliance. Not that that doesn't happen at the asset level, but a lot of that now is increasing at the entity level. Think of the new SEC proposed rules, Think of the sustainable finance disclosure regulation in Europe. Net zero target setting, while that ultimately rolls down to a building, when we talk about that in the industry, we're typically talking about something that's being done at the entity or portfolio level and many other examples. Policies, procedures around sustainability, those are limited at the entity level. So meter is building, building systems and getting towards market. The next major stop for portfolios is more 
like the boardroom. Mm-hmm. Okay. Measurable is delivered two products against those unique experiences. We acquired the business of Hatch about 120 days ago, which had a brilliant solution for bringing in real-time data, hardware and buildings and liaising with that and delivering recommendations to make that thing better. Principally, we focus here on energy and carbon reduction measures among others. The measurable core product is solving then from those assets out to that portfolio. Regulatory compliance, investor reporting, target setting, physical climate risk exposure, and many other things. But that those two products have so far only gotten us from meter to boardroom. Mm-hmm. We're still going to get to market. What's market and what do we do there? Market is everybody else. <laughs> it's everybody besides the owner or operator of that box. It's the JV partners. It's the LPs that invest in the GPs and funds who then invest in the buildings. It's the debt that powers the real estate business because most every building we look at, um, when you walk up and down Park Boulevard and Main Street, uh, it's got a loan on it. What about all those other stakeholders? How will they perceive and understand and work and transact with sustainability in mind? Here, Measurable has brought to bear a data product, or actually a set of products. So where we have what we now call asset optimization at the meter level and measurable core at the enterprise level. We've got listed real estate products and asset level products. These are API-based services that leverage the data we've amassed. We aggregate, we anonymize, and we create novel new statistics that help all these other stakeholders measure and and transact on sustainability. And that's another first mover product no one else has delivered anything like that. This suite of products now is the is the product delivery against our product vision of meter to market. Got it. Hopefully that makes sense. That's what it yeah. all is. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. Um, so when you talk about, or when the industry talks about, say, decarbonization, how does, will you just walk us through from meter to market, how this concept of decarbonization shows up for all these different stakeholders? And the, the root of that question, right, is when we think about, technology and for energy or technology like the history of my career your career technology for energy hasn't always hit and and served all those different stakeholders so can you talk about just like how all of these different stakeholders are sort of experiencing decarbonization and how that differs as you kind of cross that spectrum monster question james thanks for I know. Stuff there. you're welcome, you're welcome. <laughs> so this is the failure in the market, right? It was the lack of transparency. If I had to distill it down to one thing, I'd say it's, it's a lack of the ability to measure sustainability and it's the, the inability to then distribute that objective measure across this whole experience of stakeholders, right? Mm. Um, now, what does that mean specifically, right? If I want to start in the middle, back, we just talked about the metered market vision. We talked about measurable sort of core product for helping portfolios of real estate whether institutional or corporate, I'm sitting there as, as maybe the CEO and I'm calling out now some new net zero target. Mm-hmm. That doesn't happen at, the, at this amorphous portfolio level. What happens is somewhere way down in there, a light bulb got changed or a boiler mm-hmm. got swapped out, right? Or a thermostat got adjusted, new operating procedure, building was recommissioned, whatever. So I need to, to join the executive decision-making, the overall targets and aspirations, all the way back to the studs of the building. I have to do that. I cannot have those live in separate experiences. It was not okay to have an enterprise product and lack an asset level or meter level solution. And that's why we did it, measure what we did do to bring those two together. But it is also not the case that buildings are actually the real estate business. I'm fond of saying buildings are not brick and mortar, they are debt and equity. So you cannot have decisions around carbon reduction, which ultimately are capital decisions, without having the capital, Hmm. the debt and equity that power those portfolios. So how do we make that happen? Again, you see us move into this data uh, business to provide the connective tissue between equity investors, sovereigns, endowments, pension funds, and the like, debt providers, banks, and non-bank lenders so they can understand what the exposure of their portfolio is by way of carbon or health and well-being 
if the capital is not informed, it won't move to greener assets, can't move to greener assets. If we can't attract the capital, we can't drive the greener outcomes. Mm. So it's a bit, you know, I have two kids and talk about how the body's all connected, right? And, you know, <laughs> and all the rest. It is like that in real estate when it comes to this issue of ESG. We must have governance that must be made transparent, the incentive to make the, the executive team invest in the carbon outcomes and reductions. That must be made transparent at the asset level and at the capital markets level. And we need to move the money between these real world wrench churning outcomes and the investment decisions way upstream from that. That's mm -hmm. the task. Mm -hmm. And just for the people that maybe came from the technology or the energy side and don't know how the general you know, real estate industry works, if I got to replace a chiller, for example, or I got to electrify my heating system and I got to spend $10 million in this asset, can you talk about how that decision gets made and like where the funding comes from and how it connects back to those investors? Just yeah. maybe some mechanics sure. would be helpful for people to illustrate. Or doesn't that. get made, right, James? Like that's kind of... <laughs> yes. So I think there's a, a common misconception. So remember, we started this conversation off by me talking about how I was in the real estate business as a real estate broker and one of these like very transactional, traditional roles in the real estate business. And I sat next to the property managers. What none of us were, and what the real estate business is not is an energy management business. We're not in the commodities business, but strangely, our largest controllable expense for most buildings is commodities like energy. So it is not our business. Our business is real estate, but an ingredient of that business and a significant one is energy. So mm -hmm. I think one of the major breakdowns that's occurred is people have come at with solutions to an incorrect problem statement. Like you use too much energy and you actually care about that. The real estate owner was confused by this. Uh, presentation, right? What they do is buy and sell assets and drive yield. So we needed to reframe the little e, the discussion on electrons, and we needed to reframe that and expand that into big E, environment, as in environmental social governance. Doing that helped the real estate owner understand not commodities, but yield and risk and return. And it goes mm -hmm. like this. Your question on the board and a mechanical change out is like, I need to sell this asset one day, most likely for many funds and get a return. Mm -hmm. If my return could be diminished because it's a less sustainable building, right? It has a carbon footprint of X and that's poor performer, or it's exposed to regulatory fines and penalties like New York Local Law 97, it makes it less sellable and probably means lower asset value. That's where you find the alignment. Hmm. We had to move from electrons to environment and then risk and reward at the asset level and the buy sell for real estate to truly begin to care and move on this issue. Here's a few other complexities, by the way. So that's a big sort of major hmm. reframing and transformation the way we thought about ESG and the real estate business is it moved from little E to big E. The other thing we did is we need to embrace the complexity. I'm glad you're talking to Pierre because this is the master in complexity. When we talked about, I have a shiny new light bulb or, or, or variable fan drive or whatever the mechanical system was, shouldn't you just change the building out? The real estate uh, owner was thinking about, well, my building is 100% leased on long-term leases and I don't have any vacant. There's no intervention I'm doing today. Hmm. You need to understand the real estate life cycle. Am I an opportunistic investor who's going to re freshly bought this asset and will reposition it? That capital expenditure, that is the time then for interventions around these other things. It's trickier to do retrofits, especially a deep retrofit. If you have a solid tenant base, it's not going anywhere tomorrow. Yeah. There are also these other things, which is what are the lease considerations in my economic relationship? Have I built in the incentives for me to invest and for my tenants to maybe co-invest through amortization or lease? around energy efficiency that ultimately accrues to them and not me, right? In terms of cost savings. So that this is a function of things like net lease structures and so forth. Mm -hmm. All of those real estate considerations were where I think we started to miss the plot. We need to bring energy and sustainability back into the real estate business, talk about the real estate life cycle, the whole period of the funds, the nature of those funds, and understand that perpetually so we could spot the opportunity to make a change in that building when it made sense for the real estate strategy 
hmm. not because the light bulb was necessarily better in and of itself. There was a bigger picture we were missing. Got it. Yeah. And then I imagine that when you're designing a software product, you then need to do exactly that, which is reposition. It might be a data from a utility bill, right? And reposition and put it in terms that the real estate stakeholders care about. Can you give a few examples of how, you know, in the old world, it was, I have done energy benchmarking and I'm going to show my, you know, portfolio manager score, right? That my, my um, energy star score. So what are the new ways in which data can then be transformed to then provide the information that the, the real estate uh, stakeholders care about? Sure. I mean, that's, um, I mean, that's where you begin to have a business of measurable, right? And it, it, right. it comes to life. The, the first thing I would observe is you need a technology there to have a persistent experience with the real estate owner for all assets all the time. Mm -hmm. Because if you just dropped in, I'm a solar vendor and I have um, a panel for your rooftop and I'm trying to match that to incentives, I'm taking these point in time shots to try to understand your building and see whether or not I can make sense for you. It's much better to understand the portfolio persistently because out of that then it's working backwards at any given point in time because I have technology and I have a point of view into my buildings and portfolio, I might then be able to see the opportunity for an intervention. It does not go the other way. It is not, I have an intervention. I hope it works for you conveniently at this moment in time. It's, I have a portfolio and I might be able to absorb and invest in interventions based on my strategy over time. Big difference. So that's the high level statement. The, the second one on your question of getting, for example, from like a utility bill into like a real estate problem statement, right? Exactly. Like so yeah. let's use that, right? Let's say like there's this utility bill. I'm trying to remember the last time a decision maker at the portfolio level, let alone the executive suite, looked at any utility bill and made a decision, yeah. right? The best you might've gotten from that is a property manager who's doing budget variance reporting. Yeah, like yeah. That was really it. There was no decision making. So when we take that utility bill, among other things in the building, what you're trying to do is get that back to the sort of risk reward profile for the assets value. To do that, we're going to have to talk about things that affect overall asset value. Energy is certainly one, but there is this corollary now called carbon. That's the easiest one to talk about, the energy and carbon double whammy or, or piston engine. And carbon intensity per square foot is where you can start to get like someone's mind wrapped around this. It goes like this. If I understand that I have um, dollars per square foot lease rate, I can also understand that I have carbon in per square foot, uh, carbon intensity, and I can compare that thing. I know if my building is better or, or worse off than other buildings in my portfolio and perhaps buildings across the street from me. This is like the DNA of real estate. When I was in brokerage, what we would do is we'd go around and try to understand, quote, market. What is the building across the street versus the building I'm looking to lease in? What is the fixed rate and what are the amenities and, and value that asset that make me want to pay more or less. It's all about the comp, Michael Mandel comp stack, right? It's all about the comp and we had no environmental comp. So the place that technology can go from that little utility bill is to roll that up into this thing called carbon and energy intensity to then put that in context of market, right? Which is other buildings like it. Now you have something that real estate professionals can work with. They can bring that into their underwriting or their recommendation and say, this building is better or worse based on a full spectrum of concerns. And we can make decisions from there. That's how you get from bill to kind of more like mm -hmm. broker to, and ultimately to boardroom. Um, it's, it's a little, it's another version of that E little E to big E move that we have to make. Beautiful. Yeah. That's exactly what I was, I was kind of getting at is how do you, yeah, what is the life cycle of that one data point? And then how does it sort of travel throughout your platform? It's, Let's take, there's, there's a few, we, I feel like we do talk a lot, like our industry talks a lot about energy and carbon. I just do want to point out, there's so much else that we, we can factor in to get competitive advantage. Right mm -hmm. now, um, climate risk, transition risk, this is, these are ideas of um, the physical world's impact on the building, flood, wildfire, hurricane. And then there's also the notion of, the changing preference of customers and regulators and all the rest 
and their impacts. And um, that is now becoming very material. I mean, we just saw, what was it, Ian roll through Florida. There's mm -hmm. no um, doubt that there are a lot of industrial warehouse owners with buildings that are not taking in goods and services and are disintermediated by that. So that's one more example of, um, and where does that impact us? It's not just like there's climate risk that building. What happens actually is that there's this insurer. You're a policyholder. You have a premium to pay in order to collect a, a payout or something. Mm -hmm. Building, and that equation is changing because of this thing called climate risk and transition risk. So there it is. It's about insurance. It's about the comp. It's about the access to capital. I'll give you one more, and we can move on. Securitization, green bonds. If I, as an entity, Boston Properties, can issue $1.8 billion in green bonds, I think it was 2021, which is exactly what they did, and I can carve out just a little bit of a coupon rate discount, that is a, such a different economic impact than any number of light bulbs I might change downstream. So the, here again, we're seeing sustainability move the needle on insurance, access to capital debt, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and also the buy, sell, and the leasing decisions. That's the real estate business. Awesome. So we've been talking about platforms a little bit. I'd love to, you and I have had a discussion on point solutions and point solutions transitioning into platforms. Can you just talk about that sort of transition from your perspective and maybe even the perspective of your clients? I think you said to me last time we talked, you don't think building owners are going to buy platforms or point solutions anymore. It's all platforms here on out. So can you, can you sort of expand upon that? So some caveats. What I was specifically referring to is within the, the category of ESG. I, I think what we've seen with the rise of regulation and, and the maturation of investors and, and the sophistication they're now having around this is um, the game is too serious. Mm -hmm. It would not be viable for me to bring out measurable as a, a res reporting tool uh, pure and simple in 2023. Right. right. We right. needed more. We needed a full complement of tools. We were just talking about climate risk. That needs to be uh, uh, intimately tied into in my investor reporting capabilities, which need to be intimately tied into my asset level uh, investments and CapEx and decarbonization and, and around it goes. So I, my comment was specific. I think We'll have an appetite for innovation and real estate that that genie's out of the bottle for prop tech. We want to find ways to, you know, come back to compressed margin and technology is a wonderful way to do that. Uh, but in, in ESG, I think we saw an incredibly rapid move from experimentation and point solutions to platforms. And that's why you see Measurable doing what it's doing, which is our, our vision for meter to market is extremely expansive. We're talking today about all the stakeholders along that continuum, and insurers, lenders, investors, operators, occupiers, so on. And that calls for a sophisticated and, and interconnected platform. Um, what we're seeing then is, yes, there are other solution sets. Let's use indoor air quality. I do not see that in the long term as a separate and distinct consideration from broader ESG. Hmm. And it should and will achieve its greater value when we have it in context of building operating procedures from asset optimization, right? So we know what's good by way of energy and what's good by way of indoor air quality because they're tied together. It takes a lot of energy to bring and refresh a lot of air, but that might be the prerogative and the standard of that Tishman Inspire or Boston properties for their tenant base. So I think you have to have that together. That's really the point. That's why I'm so intent on building out um, the most rich and expansive platform when you do that make sure to be mindful that there are different personas along the way there are these energy engineers or facilities managers they don't know a whit about the sec compliance report that the cfo has to put out they just need to know or be able to communicate the data from their assets up into that report so building a platform is not about having separate products that communicate it's about having uh, personas and experiences around areas of expertise and, and need. And that's really what I think of us is building. Nice, nice. Yeah. And that aligns perfectly with a lot of my thinking and writing. I've written a lot about how I don't like the single pane of glass 
yes. acronym, the SPOG thing that seems to be, it, it's it's very, very prevalent uh, in a bunch of different pockets of the industry where people act like SPOG or single pane of glass is like the gateway to everything basically. But I, I totally agree with you where it's it's all based on individual personas and their workflows and the ability to have you know one underlying data platform and then the ability to serve different applications, different workflows to different people. Yeah. It sounds like that's what your strategy is really with this platform that you're you know, giving API access to, to basically anyone right. that wants to pay for it. And then there's these different applications or different products that that's sort right. of sit on top of that. That's right. And it's a lot of this same logic, um, James, that you're referring to, we see in many other industries, right? As we mature as an industry in our consumption technology, there is a strong pull towards rationalization and consolidation of those related tools. So emphasis on related. ESG is a big, one of the reasons platforming makes sense in ESG is a very encompassing horizontal sort of concept. We just talked about how many stakeholders and, and aspects of the real estate business it touches. So there, there's a very particularly strong incentive to bring that data together into your single pane of glass. I think we can also rinse and repeat this from other angles in the market that make us want to have this. Capital is global. Measurable search buildings in 90 countries. We're launching our first language translation to German uh, in November. Spanish, Italian follow, Japanese. Well, why? Because the capital is going into buildings all around the world. The JV partners are going into buildings all around the world. The, the investor is deploying into, you know, it's Norges and Adia are deploying into American funds and Middle Eastern and Asian funds. And Tomatic is investing here, right, in the States. So you need to have a platform, both with respect to the set of solutions, but also with respect to geos, also with respect to segments. So Measurable works in, uh, yes, real estate, existing real estate assets and funds, but a lot of our customers have credit businesses too, and their lending is not bank lenders into yet other real estate vehicles. So you need to have solutions for that because there's still just this one customer at the end of the day back there that's doing multiple strategies in multiple markets. So you see now when you look at it from a core solutioning, geo and segment perspective, you see that again, the body's all related. You need to have a platform and a single, I, you say a single pane of glass, which is totally right. I say single source of truth, right? Mm -hmm. There's still mm -hmm. one building out there with one real carbon footprint. Right. Everyone right. looks at it from a different perspective. Totally. Let's pause here for one more quick word from our sponsor, and then we'll get back to the show. We've well, talked about the importance of occupancy data over and over on the show, and the team at Butler would like to reinforce it. Occupancy data drives a variety of use cases across workplace experience, real estate planning, and facilities management, and is too valuable to be siloed in a walled garden. Every building and workspace would benefit from accurate, private, cost-effective occupancy data accessible via API. So go to www.nexuslabs.online slash 091, or click the link in the show notes to listen to Nexus Podcast episode 91 with my conversation with Rags Gupta. President of Butler on their approach to provide accurate API first occupancy data at a fraction of the cost while not being physically able to collect personally identifiable information. What do you think about, so I did this poll on LinkedIn. Uh, I like to do these sort of provocative sort of open-ended questions on LinkedIn because I just like to see what people think. Um, everyone knows I'm kind of stirring up shit, but it's still fun to see what, what happens. Um, so I asked the audience, I said, um, what do you think is going to solve fragmentation in smart buildings and decarbonization? And I said, is it M&A? Is it interoperability standards? No, I said interoperability standards was A. Is M&A B? And then I said C, put your answer in the chat. And I'll tell you, Matt, there were like 50 comments and not one person or maybe one person said all of the above, but not one person singled out M&A as like what they think is going to solve things. And I, I'm obviously I do this quarterly podcast on M&A because I think it's super interesting. You've done some acquisitions lately that I want to talk about. Um, so I'm wondering what your reaction is to that, that uh, poll and, and sort of what you think about sort of M&A for solving these different, because really what you're talking about is solving a fragmented industry so that the user journey um, 
you know, from where they're at now to decarbonize building or whatever stakeholder, you know, whatever stakeholders user journey you're talking about, you're talking about having one product kind of help them along in that journey. Um, mm -hmm. So you're, you're trying to accomplish the same thing, just going about it from, uh, you know, you're building your own products, but you're also acquiring others to sort of get to that point. So how do you, how do you think about that? Okay, so on the question, this is the one where the, you know you say, "Hey, I, I I take issue with the question because I I think you said ors, and I would just like to say ands. Like I know this is about an, an all of us solution and M and A and platforming and transparency and data and consensus around what things we're measuring and what the relative prioritization, which has a big industry component about getting to some degree of agreement about that. There is today still not a consensus." on exactly how we ought to measure a portion carbon. There's the GHG protocol, which tells us technically how to do it. But then there's a lot of folks that say, oh, I don't, um, I have a net lease. I'm not really, I might own it, but I don't really control it. And maybe I shouldn't be on the hook for that. Um, and I'm not gonna report it at all, by the way, because uh, I don't think it's actionable. So there's still a lot of um, diversity on the uh, foundations of how we ought to measure and then ultimately act on ESG. So I, I think it's a lot of ands. We need consensus, we need technology, platforming, and integrations was one of your points. I completely agree with that. And we need um, consolidation uh, and, and in the best possible way to provide a simpler user experience that supports the most other stakeholders. Um, so that's my response to your, your question. And then as it relates to like your other piece, James, on like, what's specific than the role of m a in it. Look, we measurable, but we prop tech uh, have grown up quite fast. I mean, we're really mm -hmm. talking about a decade of radical change, cultural change, and investment has been brought to bear. You have whole venture funds, prop tech venture funds. Canberra Creek is an awesome venture fund who backed us in our series A. You, of course, have the notables like Fifth Wall, AO, PropTech, and many others. They've created the firmament and the wherewithal to do big things, which is really cool and tons mm -hmm. of fun. And yeah. at the same time, you have a willing audience. The real estate industry has gotten a memo. We do need to change. We need to change to become more sustainable. We need to change to be more uh, digital, to have a better customer experience for our tenants and for our investors. Um, so there's a lot that's happened in, in 10 years. Now it's time to do that. <laughs> so the onus is on the entrepreneurs out there to bring a bold and big vision against a known category and problem statement. Ours is ESG. And to not do that incrementally. I do not believe, well, of course, measure launches every month. We launch new functionality, agile process, just as you expect. That is not anymore all we do. We will absolutely be acquiring more businesses and thoughtfully bringing them in to fill perhaps white space that can't be productized fast enough to meet the customer's need hmm. or to take us into segments and geos, geographies, that the customer needs to be serviced in. Um, and, and, and you have to have that. That's no different, I think, to me. It's another tool. It's a tactic against the imperative of bringing full value to the customer. If as a company, you cannot or will not do that, I do not believe that will be competitive in the category. Mm -hmm. it, it's fine when you have a new novel niche um, that's figuring its way out, but the second you have a category, you have a dominant and clearly spoken need, you have to be able to wield m and uh, otherwise the market will be fast you. Fascinating, fascinating. So we talked about hatch data in the M&A category. We talk about WeGoWise, which is a little bit more recent. Um, and some people might be listening to this podcast in two years, so then it won't be recent. But I'd love to hear your your thought behind the WeGoWise uh, acquisition. Okay, cool. Well, if they're listening in two years, maybe we should tell them what these businesses are. So re recall <laughs> that hatch. And they're interesting. They, have, they share a little, the common thread here. Hatch came out of Internet. And now purchased Internoc. This is the energy intelligence software of Internoc, which is a publicly traded company and, and had a big business in demand response. And Hatch had the benefit then of significant investment and actual exposure to actual buildings and actual data, a billion operating hours of uh, building operating hours to build models to then ultimately be good at recommending what to do to improve those assets. 
So that was the business of Hatchet Required, and we have branded now and placed as apps optimization in the Lego Wise has a little bit of an inverted story of that. They were a startup. They came out of servicing affordable housing specifically, and their business was um, providing benchmarks and utility automation to, to that segment. They were, I saw them first way back in the dark ages when I was at CBRE. And I thought, wow, this is a very cool business. They're providing this energy and carbon benchmarks. Carbon was beginning to enter the lexicon. Mm -hmm. Um, They were doing this at the unit level. So residents, apartments, they had an offering for single family residential. And so they were very more retail oriented where I came from the institutional real estate side. And I thought this was just very exciting and compelling technology and the right idea for the wrong time. Mm. This was back in 2000 and okay. yeah. Yeah, in 2011, we hadn't evolved our, our jargon and, and identified these bigger ESG needs. In fact, ESG wasn't a, a term of art. They were acquired by a public company. So they didn't, get, they didn't come from a public company, they were acquired by a public company called Appfolio. Appfolio saw the promise in pieces of their technology. And when the time came to, to do or turn that into a business for them or not, they made the decision that it wasn't going to be the type of business they wanted to be in, but it had become a business for folks like ourselves. And so we had a relationship there and established ourselves as a brand that made that a great partnership to have. So what results from this acquisition is several things. We go wise, as I mentioned, serves residential real estate. As you've been following this conversation, you've been hearing me talk about data centers and office buildings, measurable mm-hmm. commercial real estate solution. We now have the ability to authentically serve resi- or, excuse me, real estate. No more preface of residential or commercial, just real estate. Hmm. Really big deal. It's a big deal for things like this. Institutional money is moving into single family homes. These hmm. platforms of uh, invitation homes who invented the space, the Pretium and Gem and, and many others um, that will continue. And as institutional money comes in, they're going to carry with them in the many concerns of affordability and environmental impact that we are in the business of helping with. So residential is absolutely a place. It must be, we must be in a genuine real estate platform with no limits. If it's a structure, baseball stadium, major league baseball, great measurable customer, uh, single family home, yours or mine. Great. Should be a measurable customer on a platform being benchmarked. The second thing that WeGoWise had, it was very unusual, but a core element of their business was bringing in utility information to benchmark these buildings. They built uh, in a very foresighted uh, way, uh, a utility automation infrastructure and backbone. Templates that can automate and capture utilities, bring that in, a whole suite of technologies to maintain that infrastructure, uh, quality assure that data and so on. I think this is a tremendously underappreciated piece of that business. And now what we are able to do then is is feed our platform with a proprietary and vertical solution all the way down to the utility, as well as with a hatch now down to the meters or sub meter and systems level. So you have ground truth from bills, from systems. That's a powerful combination. That means our customers get a better experience, higher quality. It means we control the business model. But it doesn't just benefit us. I think one of the things that you do when you platform is you need to make sure you have an ecosystem and you need to make sure you add value to all those ecosystem uh, players and partners. Hmm. So one thing I envision doing with this is that API and that technology should service all our partners. It should allow unfettered access to raw data. I believe in adding value to data and not really gatekeeping uh, primary source information. It's not ours, it's the customer's anyways. So we might have a clever tool for getting it out of shovel, but I really believe in letting that data breathe and letting the customer direct it to where they want to go for the best outcomes. And those outcomes will not be solved, no matter how big measurable can get and how many businesses you acquire by us alone. It must be solved by a community. And our job and our our responsibility is to make data available to the community as the customer directs us. So... Utility data is an example, and they have this infrastructure that I intend to make available, not just to us, but to everybody else that wants to play and add value. Mm-hmm. Thirdly, oh, okay, okay, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Well, third, just to finish, you always have got to have threes. 
Um, I thirdly, they, they had that we go serve 1.6% of us apartment units. It is phenomenal. I mean, that not to say there's not 98.4 still to go, but my goodness for a relatively small business, um, to, to get that type of adoption is very impressive. And it happens to be in a place that we really had an opacity. While we've done good work in getting visibility on commercial assets, um, and by we, I mean government, measurable, many other businesses, residential is really opaque. Mm -hmm. And WeGo had a very rare ability then to access data and to try to provide and build a resilient database around what sustainably is in that segment of the market. So I think that can help us build better transparency and more tools um, for people who want to invest there, rent there, right? Um, mm -hmm. And improve those buildings as well. So yeah. Yeah. yeah, I like the, the rule of threes as well. <laughs> if anyone reads my writing, uh, I'll never use four and I'll never use two of anything. Yeah, it's either got to be three or five bullet points or numbered lists. Yeah, totally, 100%. Yeah. Uh, um, so I want to just real quick, uh, a couple minutes left here on the data platform. Um, so that's kind of what you're hitting at here is the ability to expose metrics, data, raw data, data access, all of this. Can you give a couple of examples of other businesses that might be building on top of your data platform? Like what kind of use cases uh, you're, you're thinking about there? Of course. So um, remember, we've got a multi-product platform. We have internal APIs to those products and we have external APIs. Um, let's start with the core product, the enterprise product. There's a bi-directional API on that. You can both read from and write to. Hmm. People that are writing to, Yardi. A lot of our customers use MRI or Yardi or some building engine, some other operating platform, asset management platform, property management platform. And so the, they're, back to that statement, there's just this one building, that building may reside in some other system and the customer likes it that way. So let's not duplicate work. So let's have those entities right to measurable. That's also nice because you want to keep, there's, there's also just one portfolio, you want uh, one answer for what I own, where it is, what the status is across all my applications of value. Mm -hmm. so writing to measurable. Who else writes to measurable? Real page. Right, a large UBM company, utility bill management business with a whole range of value propositions, they can write portfolios of the real estate into measurable so that customer can then have single sign on and enjoy a quick and easy ESG experience. So we're adding value to one another. We're getting more customers, we're um, getting data faster and onboarding faster, and real page customers are getting more out of their data. Mm. Yeah, that's great. So that's power of APIs in an interconnected ecosystem. So you can write to, you can read from. Our customers are developing sophisticated digital strategies that are bringing together leasing data and ESG data, and, and, and they're developing marketing intelligence around that. Those data warehouses are places that we need to send that data programmatically. And the customer can put a Power BI or some tool on top of it and go off and, and innovate. So that's an example of what's already happening in terms of both read and write. Uh, how about other third-party technologies that consume raw or semi, you know, or, or refined data from measurable to power their tools? So not just a, a dumping it into a data warehouse with an overlay, but think of like building engines out in Europe who wants to help customers with prem. There's so many things that reside in measurable that we can support other interesting companies and partners with the single power of read and write. Mm -hmm. That's the core application. What about the data products that we've authored, which are themselves, there's no UI on those, those are API products. So if you go to Measurable's website and you look in solutions and you'll see a data, you'll see a dropdown there. Now we navigate to it for a variety of APIs for partners, like I just described, for our core system, uh, for customers, and then for consumers of data products. And that's a read uh, business and it allows them to um, it allows them to post addresses and building characteristics and get um, statements back about regulatory exposure or certification status, climate risk and energy carbon intensity and so forth. So these are very, what's also great about all this is it empowers a constellation of value. It uh, allows the customer to do so much more with a single source of truth or data. And it's incredibly scalable. 
So the big picture behind our conversation today is that there's a problem with climate. There are social inequities. The real estate industry has a stake in this. And we need to go so much faster than one building at a time. We need to move trillions of dollars around scalably. And you're going to have to have solutions like this to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Last piece of the platform uh, equation, right, is one of the things I like to nerd out on is network effects, right? So the, the ability for a um, someone to build a product that then gets better when other people use it, right? Um, can you talk about the network effects between all these different stakeholders that are using the platform, putting data in, taking data out, enriching the data set? Um, how, do, how does that work? One example, I'll just throw one out. One example is when you guys have more buildings on the platform, you're then able to do better benchmarking because you have a better data set. So the fact that you have more customers coming in makes the you know N plus one customer, their insights are better. So you, can you talk about how, how you think about the network effects that the platform approach takes? When the business started, we worked with our first customers to share, to, to bring the data in and allow us to create, we put a mask over that, we aggregate and anonymize. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, one of the, to share that data and to then be able to benchmark each other. Right now, our customers can't zoom in and identify that that's Boston Property Building or Tishman's Building, but they can understand um, for a like kind asset in the same zip code, for example, same size, type city, age built, what relative performance is. Transparency is the best, you know, sunlight's the best disinfectant here. And we have an environmental externality in the business. This is a way to bring transparency to that and help people move. When we did that, the problem statement from industry was we can't benchmark. We cannot understand our, our greenness, even if you told me my carbon and how I didn't know how good or bad that was. I can't wait around for a year for, you know, sort of various voluntary framework to give me a, a backwards looking statement from sort of a black box. I need a transparent model and I need a visceral real time response. And so it was the problem statement of the customer that led us to do that. We have worked with our customers to make the better product. And we all understand that it is in everyone's best interest to grow that data set, to merge essentially to what the market truly is. I mean, it's just statistics. The larger N gets, right? It begins to converge with what the actual statement is. And that's what medical has been able to accomplish for markets like New York and LA, where you have a lot of institutional real estate. We have such a substantial footprint that we can actually give more or less ground truth. Hmm. Now the markets can work. Now they can understand relative performance of assets and quality of assets. And now the best ownerships can go out there and compete on the, that, that uh, information. So that's where benchmarking is absolutely a great example of we continue to improve and the advantages that are gained compound as you get more data, but it begets more data because people want to build a benchmark and compare to market. Beautiful. Yeah. And and people talk about platforms a lot. It's like single pane of glass is my biggest pet peeve. And then like platforms are my next biggest pet peeve yeah. because um, when people say I have a platform, I always ask like, well, where's what network effects are there? Um, mm -hmm. And and we you can get into the argument of what it's a platform and what's not. We won't do that today. Um, but um, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you my last question, which is sort of where to from here. Um, you don't have to tell us who's going to, who's going to be the next acquisition. Uh, that, that's probably too much to ask, but, uh, wh where are you headed from, from here? Um, mm -hmm. as you think about building the platform out further, but, and by the way, you're absolutely right to call that out about platforms, right? It's, a, it's, we've got a lot of jargon and a lot of it's overused. Um, I, my pet peeve is green, Right, like green is a color. <laughs> get rid of that one, and I want to get on to kind of ESG and real objective measures. So it's, I think that's fine. And you're right to observe that platforms have some some notion of network and virality to them. Mm -hmm. They often are are multi party. So and yeah. we, didn't, we talked about benchmarking and the value of people contributing data, but what about the value of being able to buy and sell buildings and carry that chain of data and that chain of custody over to the new ownership who's on that same platform? What about the value of the LP being able to come in and liaise directly with you? So there's no middleman between your conversations around financial and sustainability performance. You can speak directly with the LPs who can be on the same platform and get visibility across GPs and so on and go. So I, I really think that that's so critical, measurable, once the 
cultivate that and nurture multi-party, multi-product, and so on, mm -hmm. all leveraging that, in my words, single source of truth, right? So yeah. that in terms of what's next, I think we've done a really good job today, James, of sort of like calling out. And I, I, I'm very proud. Every year I sit down on LinkedIn, I try to pre-write it because I published it on January 1 if I do my job. Um, and it's hard to get much work done in the first of the year after December 31. And I lay out our business plan. And I talk about what we will try to accomplish this year, what markets we will move into, what segments we will pursue, what product, major product advances we will attempt to make, wh whether we'll raise capital to do all that. I like to talk about transparency and try to live that as a business. So today we talked about our strategy. It is exactly as we described, to platform the business, multi-product, multi-segment, multi-geo. Um, it is to use M&A. It is to capitalize the business to be able to do all those things. It is to leverage the virality and inherent network effects of, of the, the business. We will continue to do more of that. We will raise a significant amount of capital, um, which I'm eager to share with everybody to make sure we can keep the pace of innovation up while improving all the existing technologies. Hmm. We are not bug free. There's plenty of places the user experience could be snappier, um, the front end technology constantly changes and I want to move up to the, you know, the best and, and most beautiful UIs, have a great native digital uh, mobile experience. So I think you, that means you have to have innovation, which is about market expansion, segment expansion and new features. Um, ESG is very dynamic. We're getting new standards, new regulations all the time, but you have to take care of the core. You have to feed the existing customers with great security. You know, we're going through SOC 2, this is not glamorous stuff, but that's the responsibility, I think, of being a good business. Um, we are in an extremely swift growth curve. We can take this business to a public outcome. And I think that it's important that our customers, investors know that that's a North Star for us because one of the great fears I hear from uh, customers, prospective customers, is are you going to be around for me? Mm. It's been around since the 80s. People know they're going to be there. I think that when you work with startups, though, you know, I'm proud to say we're here 10 years now, that people still worry, you know, are you going to go away tomorrow? Oh, the markets are going to be tough. Do you have the cash? Do you have an investor base? So I work really hard to make sure our customers know that we are extremely well resourced. We're backed by Salesforce and S&P Global and Energy Impact Partners. And that way um, we can be a partner in scaling and continue to innovate for the next 10 years. Awesome. Awesome. All right. My last question. Been grilling you. Thank you for that. I thought you said that was the last question. <laughs> Sorry. This is the it's a it's a more fun, personal, bigger picture question, not related to technology, totally related to technology. But uh it's my last question always. What's one link that you can share, or maybe two, uh, of a book, podcast, TV show, movie? Uh, whatever that you just think, you know, has a big impact on you or has had a big impact on you that you'd like to share with the audience? Huh. Well, I, you, so you, you kind of prepared me for this and I admitted that like the, the place that business has cost me is like my social life and my pop culture. So I, like, I don't have any TV shows to recommend, movies to go see, um, all the rest, but I can offer, I told you I would put up and promote. Of course, I wrote a book, take at least a look at the first uh, chapter, which is written by Dave Polk, former global head of sustainability at CBRE. Cool. In that book, uh, you have one of the sort of key figures in this movement from green to ESG. And what that story is, is a story of mentorship and partnership for me to grow up in this industry with a guy like that um, helping and looking out is something I would want for any entrepreneur. And it's something that I would ask every customer and every investor to just remember the human relationship that we have. So that's uh, that book. Then there's um, a book that a venture capitalist gave me, which is called uh, The Billionaire Who Wasn't. And oh. it's a story of it's, I think it's Curtis Feeney. Don Feeney, Curtis Feeney. Feeney is the right last name for sure, uh, who gave away fortune. And they're an unbelievable story of how and why he went about doing that. And nobody knew. 
Nobody knew about it. Yeah, that's so awesome. A billionaire who wasn't check that out for any entrepreneur, a totally humbling uh, book. So there's my, there's the two that I can offer. That's awesome. Well, thank you, Matt. Uh, thanks for coming on the show. It's been fun to catch up again and uh, hear what everything, everything you're working on. Thanks for talking about the business with me, James. Good to see you. All right, friends. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Nexus Podcast. For more episodes like this and to get the weekly Nexus newsletter, which, by the way, readers have said is the best way to stay up to date on the future of the smart building industry, please subscribe at nexuslabs.online. You can find the show notes for this conversation there as well. Have a great day.